My name is Amelia Semperbon, and I am a community specialist on Esri's Story Maps team. Um, and I apologize in advance for any barking that you might hear in the background. My dog is, as always, a co-host in any webinar I do. Um, so just a few housekeeping items before we get started on these presentations. Uh, we will be using the Q&A function of Zoom. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them there and a member of our team will either answer it within the chat or live at the end of this session. Um, and then this session is also being recorded and it will be made available on our YouTube feed within the next week or so. So with that, I will get started. So everyone, again, welcome to Story Maps Live. This is, this is our 11th uh, installment now and I'm really excited for this one. Uh, this is our episode on queer geography. So I'll just give a super brief overview and then we can get started with all of the presentations. So first we're gonna have uh, an introduction to ArcGIS story maps from our founder, Alan Carroll. Uh, and then we'll kind of just go into what's new and what's been happening with the ArcGIS story maps builder and Ross will do that. And then we will go into our story, our featured storyteller uh, and he'll explain a little bit about how he uses ArcGIS story maps for his work. And this month we have Sean Dunnington joining us as our featured storyteller. He will of course talk a little bit more uh, during his part, but just a really brief overview of him. He is um, a really amazing human being who uses story maps to create stories centered around queer geography and queer space and place. So with that, I will get started with throwing it over to you, Alan. Thanks, Amelia. Let me share my screen. Oops, I think you need to unshare. Great. All right, uh, so, so great to have you all here. I'm gonna move relatively quickly because we're really excited to have Sean here. Uh, but uh, just in case uh, not all of you know about um, story maps, I'm going to give the basics. Uh, and for those of you who are familiar, you can just maybe take a brief nap while I do this. Uh, at any rate, story maps, of course, work on the web and they combine interactive maps that are hosted on Esri's cloud service, ArcGIS Online, with multimedia content. So your photos, your videos, your audio, and your text, of course, to tell stories about the world. And we're seeing stories, uh, literally hundreds of thousands of stories on just about every topic under the sun uh, at every scale from uh, local to, uh, to planet spanning. They work on a variety of screen sizes. So in other words, story maps are responsive. Uh, we work hard to make sure they work just as beautifully on small screens uh, and medium screens as on big screens. It's best to author on uh, desktop, but, uh, but they're just as viewable on uh, no matter what the format is. Uh, and the real secret sauce to me of story maps is that they, they incorporate interactive builders. So <clears throat> I am not a technical person. I know nothing about uh, CSS and HTML and JavaScript and all that stuff. I don't need to because, uh, and neither do you because the, of this builder, which allows you to quite intuitively assemble uh, what we call blocks, which is featured in this, uh, in our so-called block palette. Uh, uh, piece by piece into these, uh, these multimedia narratives in a, again, in a very intuitive way. Story maps are hosted by Esri on ArcGIS online, just as the maps within them are. That doesn't mean that Esri claims any kind of ownership. It's just a place to, uh, to park the content and then you can, you can embed or link to and do all sorts of things uh, with the content from there. A little bit of history, we, uh, we started we, we put out our first um, storytelling app about a decade ago, uh, and we accumulated a series of a half dozen or so uh, separate web apps, that each of which uh, presented a different user experience combining maps and multimedia content. And those uh, became quite popular, but they also started to age a little bit. And we also weren't terribly happy that, that people had to go through a variety of learning curves. So three, four years ago, we started work on what we now uh, think is the cat's meow, which is uh, ArcGIS story maps. Lots of advantages here. I've talk, told you about the, uh, their versatility. Um, it's, the design is modernized. We've worked really hard to make them work uh, essentially mobile first. 
Uh, but a, key, a really key function of ArcGIS story maps is that those different user experiences that used to be sequestered in these separate apps are now integrated into a single builder, which means that you don't have multiple learning, cur learning curves, but it also means that you can mix and match those immersive experiences within a single story. So we urge you to fully embrace ArcGIS story maps. It's been a really exciting ride. As you can see, our growth curve has been pretty uh, dizzying, happily so. We're now actually over 1.7 million story maps hosted on, on ArcGIS Online. And they're being used by lots and lots of organizations. Earlier this week, Ross and I had a, a webinar with NOAA, which has produced and hosts hundreds of stories. Uh, same with EPA and other organizations like the National Forest Service and Park Service, et cetera. Lots of the big nonprofit organizations, especially in the conservation space, but also humanitarian organizations and others are creating their own branded story maps. Uh, also Smithsonian and my alma mater, National Geographic is doing more and more with story maps. Um, something that's been really thrilling to us is that they're really taking off in the classroom and in the education community in general. About a third of our audience <coughs> are students and educators. Uh, and in fact, uh, something like 18 or 28 of the top 30 uh, users in terms of the number of stories uh, produced uh, are in the education community. So uh, that's an exciting uh, phenomenon for us that we're continuing to support and encourage. encourage. Um, so with that, I'm gonna stop my share and turn it over to Ross. Hi everyone, thanks so much, Alan. Um, I am going to share my screen and give you all an update on all the things we've been working on. So the latest updates to uh, ArcGIS story maps. Now, for those of you who are new to story maps, uh, really wanna share how to get started and then jump into these updates. So an important URL to remember is um, esri.com slash story maps. When you go here, you end up at our product landing page. This is a really helpful resource for getting started with ArcGIS story maps, but also seeing what's being produced by the community. Almost every day we're updating this with new stories, new resources, anything from storytelling tips to uh, example stories from the community. We also have a resources section that can be really helpful for taking your stories to the next level. So say there's a new block that you're interested in trying out, we probably have a blog post or some helpful uh, resources to explore about it. We also host videos like our, uh, our previous StoryMaps live events so you can hear the featured storytellers um, from before. If you want to launch the tool itself, you just go up to this blue button, click launch. And here you'll log in and start uh, exploring the ArcGIS Story Maps ecosystem. On the left here, we have stories, collections, and themes. Um, these are really helpful, just quick links to check out. And we also have these uh, resources down here so that you can uh, get started and uh, go deeper with your stories. Now, if you want to launch the builder itself, you click new story and you can start from scratch or start with a uh, block already assembled. If we start from scratch, you can see it's really easy to uh, see the builder. See the builder, there it is. <laughs> and uh, start typing. And like Alan mentioned, uh, how you add more content is using the content block here. And you can see there are the basic blocks, the media blocks, and the immersive blocks. Now we have many resources on how to get started and uh, what those blocks are all about. So I wanna kind of move forward and really focus on what we think is new and cool uh, in ArcGIS story maps. Um, these are new features that have been released within uh, the last couple months um, since our last story maps live. Um, the first uh, really exciting announcement is this timeline block. So we've heard from users that they'd like an easy way to 
add in events that are chronological or have a way of organizing information um, using a simple uh, feature like this. Now you can see it's really easy to find this just within the block palette by going to timeline here. And when you add that in, you have the option of a couple different layouts. One is this single sided or what we call waterfall, um, which is more of a vertical um, as opposed to a side docked um, option. And you can see it's really easy to add both events as well as spacers. So if we were to add a new event, we can just say 2021. And you can add an image really easily. And so this is a really easy way to add uh, some, some nice visual aids to enhance your stories. Now you can also add this in the sidecar block itself. Um, again, a really nice way of organizing information and communicating uh, temporal information to your audience. Something that's really exciting is seeing how uh, you all are innovating with the blocks we create. So, you know, this timeline block was is sort of meant for, you know, having a date and a description, but we're seeing people also use this for things like a syllabus or uh, to show you know, an agenda for a program. So uh, really urge you to take these blocks and, and innovate and uh, create something that's going to be helpful for your specific use case. In addition, we have new floating uh, media options. So whenever you add in an uh, image or a map, you see there are these different floating options um, and sizing options. Um, you might have noticed that there's this new float right option. And so you can see uh, this gives you more flexibility as you uh, assemble your stories and um, you know, create the layout and reading experience that you want. Um, the next element that I'm really excited to demo is uh, some of the enhancements to collections. So for those of you who don't know what collections are, um, it's a feature within uh, ArcGIS story maps where you can actually combine individual stories in one place. And uh, we've developed some new layouts and uh, have app integration now. So if we go back to our kind of landing page here, you can see on the left, there's this collections option. In collections, you can see the ones that, that I've author, authored already. But if I want to start a new collection, simply go to new collection. You can add a title and a description. Um, and then you can start adding stories uh, directly in uh, to your collection itself. You click done, and then you can see they're all here in place. To change the layout options, you simply go to the design panel and you can click, uh, you start out with this grid option. You can then go to magazine, which actually has sort of a featured or uh, primary story up front, and then the others are smaller down below, so maybe a featured story. Um, or you can have this uh, more journal uh, layout. Again, it's more vertical, and you can see they stack on top of each other. Again, really uh, powerful features that we're happy to release. And uh, just in terms of some tips, we recommend using this grid layout when you have a lot of stories. Um, say you have, you know, you know, 10, 10 or more stories, it can be really helpful to use this grid layout because it does a really, it's really efficient at um, laying out a lot of information altogether. Um, in addition, if you haven't explored it, highly recommend checking out the tabbed and the bulleted navigation options. Um, 
what that does is, you know, when I uh, select that, I can preview it here. So when I'm in a specific story, up here at the top, it actually lists the name of the story itself. Uh, that can be really helpful for navigating between them. In addition to being able to add stories, you can now add um, various apps as well. So if you're familiar with some of Esri's other web applications like Survey123, um, those can be integrated directly into, into your collection. So for instance, here's a Survey123 um, that we have. I will change my layout to be uh, this magazine layout. I'll preview it. And you can see my Survey123 is integrated right in there. Um, and so hopefully, you know, this provides some options for taking uh, large stories, maybe breaking them up into chapters, and also integrating other tools that um, Esri provides. Um, so that is the end of uh, sort of the demo that I'm going to show. There's also a blog post um, up on our ArcGIS blog site that goes through all of these in more detail. Um, so we'll be sharing those links. Um, and I'm really curious uh, what you guys think about these enhancements. So I'm going to launch a poll um, for a minute. And so feel free to uh, check which enhancement you're most excited to try out. And again, if you have any questions about these uh, new features, feel free to put them in the Q&A uh, section of this webinar. Um, we're getting lots of submissions. We'll let it go for another 30 seconds or so. Um, and then uh, keep moving on with the rest of the webinar. Okay, the results are in. Okay, I'm going to share these results. So it looks like folks are excited about the timeline block, um, but also adding apps to a collection. That's really exciting to see. Um, so we'll be sure to share this with uh, the rest of the team and uh, keep moving on with the rest of the webinar. Um, so the next segment is our featured storyteller. It's really exciting to be able to have Sean with us today. And so I am going to hand things over uh, to Sean to uh, share his, his really inspiring work. Thanks a lot. Hello, everyone. <laughs> my, favorite, my favorite thing about Zoom is speaking to a Brady Bunch panel of <laughs> no faces but mine. <laughs> so even though I know there's a hundred people here <laughs> and the whole and a team behind story maps, um, it <laughs> it's um yep, I I uh, I lost my train of thought on that one. Hello, my name is Sean Dunnington. My pronouns are he, him, his. I am currently in Hawaii, land of the Kanaka Maoli. And I am very grateful to be here today. So thank you to the Story Maps team for having me and for giving me the chance to spotlight the importance and relevancy of queer stories and highlighting queer stories through geography and maps and visualizing space and place. I'm gonna start with a quote, that's right. This is, and you, the, the, I think my least favorite thing about wearing glasses is you can see my secrets. You can see what I'm looking at if it's not you. <laughs> so you might, I have only a few notes that, um, but you might see them reflected through my, my eyes. So this is a quote from historian Joan Nessel. We need to know that we are not accidental, that our culture has grown and changed with the currents of time, that we, 
like others, have a social history comprised of individual lives and community struggles. So that was historian Joan Nessel. That quote resonates with me very deeply because the, the history of queer folks in the LGBTQ plus community is largely invisible or purposefully erased. It's something when we look at a map, we might not think, how is this map queer? Or where are queer people? Or how do we even think of space in itself as queer? And what I love about this quote is it, it, it challenges me to rethink what does it mean to actively and purposefully think about the currents of our time and how do we put ourselves back on the map after we've been taken off. So thank you to her. And now I will start sharing with you all. So this is my collection, <laughs> as Ross just explained. I made this yesterday. These are some of the maps that I have made, some of the story maps. Um, you can see my, my face right there. It looks like my face now. Um, there are, I think, tulips behind me. So um, I think let's, like it says, get started. I don't know what happens if we click on that. Let's, let's find out. It just, it just goes right into it. Perfect. So I'll start by saying that I am by no means a queer geographer. I am a storyteller. I am a playwright. I tell and share stories that are focused and centered around queer place and space. And that's why queer geography is something that resonates so easily with me. It's something that I um, have quickly fallen in love with. I first started learning, well, actually, you know what? I can, instead of just telling you, I can show you <laughs> how I got into this. So I'm gonna share a few maps with you. There's one specific one that I really wanna get into that I made last night just for this, but I wanna give you a brief overview of the many possibilities of story maps and why I like it so much. So this is me. Um, and then I wrote, this is a little geography of me. So I was born in New York City. If you click on this little dot, it'll even say St. Vincent's Hospital where I was born and it does not exist anymore. Um, and we'll keep going. I was raised in Hawaii Island. And if you click on these little things, I am currently in Waimea. I'm visiting or staying with unexpectedly um, my parents. And this is a beach I love. And then I went to the University of Redlands. I got my degree in applied playwriting. It was an experimental degree where I got to basically apply playwriting to places where it wouldn't traditionally belong. And during that time, I, after collecting so many stories and analyzing them and reading them, I came to the uh, understanding that many queer people, most queer people have before me, which is that we are not in the books. We are not represented um, accurately in well-intentioned in many cases. Of course, there are so many playwrights, authors, people out there who have made incredible queer stories, but the ones that I had um, were really existed within, within the realm of heteronormativity. What does that mean? We'll, we'll get into that. So yeah, I'm a playwright, blah, 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 all this stuff. Oh, there's, there's me and my friends. Okay, let me get on with it. So uh, yes, I am a playwright. And so here are, here's a little map of some plays that I've had produced. So this was my very first play I wrote in high school. That was terrible. Um, and yeah, and then we get into when I'm in school and I kind of just give a little overview of who the producer was, the themes and where it was with a little picture and where it is on the map, which I love that this is something I can do. So a lot of my plays focus on how our, how is our queerness shaped by the places we're in? 
And that's something that time and time again, I just keep revisiting. And it's something that I can't get away from and something that I, uh, I definitely now at this point embrace. So queer story mapping, here we go. Here's a little video. You probably can't hear sound, but also you don't need to hear my sound. I just wrote me swinging into queer geography, an accurate metaphor. Here I go, right into a, into a uh, that beach I really like, the same, the same one. So queer geography is a pretty new concept to me, new as in I've really only been studying it this past year. I began work last summer or I just hopped onto a project with the Esri Conservation Program. And I was uh, co-authoring sections of an inclusive history of conservation GIS with Charles Convis, who is here. Um, and that's when I really started thinking, how do we track queer space? How is it being tracked? And I, did, I got into this rabbit hole of collecting, reading everything I can around queer geography. And what I've learned is, it is studied, it is documented by a few very dedicated queer geographers, but for the most part, there is so much more space in academia that is yet to be taken up by this topic. There is space in our collective understanding of geography that has not even been remotely tapped into. And I really appreciate all the queer geographers out there who have made this work possible and who have gotten me into it as a storyteller. And it's something that I think is really important to highlight. And uh, blah, 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 that sums it up. Oh, and here's a teapot garden, perfect. So let's get into this thing I made last night. This is, I named this Queering the Map, Visualizing Queers, in a very basic intro to queer geography for you, our attendees. Um, yep, June 24th, that is today, there we go. So what is queer? You, I am using this word a lot. So let's go over a brief timeline of what this <laughs> word means. There you go, Ross, the timeline feature. I couldn't vote on, the, on the, the, the thingy because I am a panelist, but I would have voted for timeline and I was very excited to use it. So here's your very brief Western history of the word. To any historians out there who know more about linguistics than I do, which is Anyone who is a historian and anyone who knows about linguistics, sorry. So in the 1910s, gays and lesbians called themselves queers. Some people were calling them queers in a mean way, but mostly they use it for themselves. In the 1940s, straight people stole it and they made it into a word that was basically to insult anyone of a dissident sexuality or gender, not within the, the normal scope of heteronormativity. And then the 1980s, during the AIDS epidemic, we took it back. And now we call ourselves queer to this day. Of course, some people still use it as an insult. Some people who might be more from these times uh, are still uncomfortable with it as a term because it's something that can trigger them or has caused harm to them. So if queer is a word that does not make you comfortable because you are queer yourself or in the LGBTQ community, I totally, I respect you and many <laughs> more queers to come. So prepare yourself. If queer makes you uncomfortable and you identify as straight, think about it. Why does it make you uncomfortable? And I'll let you sit in that for a second. Okay, so queer theory is a big plays a big role in queer geography. And what I love about queer is that it is in itself queer. So queer has been redefined over and over and over again. It concurrently exists as all types of nouns, verb and adjective. You can really use queer in a myriad of ways, which is something that I love. So queer theory, argues, and I'll read what I wrote because <laughs> this will sound better than me trying to summarize from my brain. Queer theory argues that sexuality, homosexual and heterosexual, the binary, is a modern product designed by and for systems of power. It rejects the binary of, so queer theory rejects the binary of homosexual and heterosexual, as well as the normalcy of heteronormativity. So when we think about queerness and we apply it to space, we start to reimagine space as queer or even queer space itself. So this is where we get into the territory of queer geography. Ooh, and if you click this, it takes you to a little essay I wrote, which is right here, Queer Queries, GIS. 
And it's a little essay about people, theory, queer theory, and maps. And uh, if you want to read that, you can. I also use the story maps feature for this, <laughs> to write this essay. I just thought it would be a fun way to do it. And I love this visual. So back to here. So I made this little thing for you called Visualizing Queer Space and Geography, Stories from the United States of America. So I put out this uh, Google form a couple of weeks ago, just asking friends to please submit their stories. The prompt was, how my geography shapes my queerness and how my queerness influences my geography. So to think about the places and spaces that we enter and how that influences forms our relationship with our queerness, but also how does our queerness change the shape of the geography we're in? So before I get into this, I'll say that queer geography can mean just really so many things. It can mean stories. It can be visualizing stories, showing a place marker for where queers have been or places that queer people have changed. And then you can see what I wrote that it can tackle really um, crucial issues like racism, immigration, public health, globalization, et cetera. And it can document our history. We can document act activism, violence, legislation. You'll sometimes see maps that show states that, um, and this is back in like 2014, states that have legalized same-sex marriage and states that haven't. That is queer geography. Something that I do with Expedia groups and orbits is I create maps that highlight queer businesses. So this is a map of queer bars and to how to support them during the pandemic um, and little links on fundraisers to keep them open because queer bars are spaces that many of us identify as our homes. Now, some queer theorists and queer geographers might identify a gay bar as gay space versus queer space, space that is commodified, space that is sold, space that is comfortable in a straight environment, which might look different than queer space as in um, political groupings, as in zaps, which is a word that queers, queers use to, um, zaps are a thing that queers do. It's like a performance of activism um, there are, and I did the same thing here with Expedia on queer shops to support. And there, you can see this little map that I love. Amelia told me she really liked this purple color. I also like it. So let me get back to the, the visualization. So that was all to say, queering space can mean whatever you want it to mean. There is no right or wrong way to do it. So in this, you can see I have a little map. I only have nine stories. And these are just some people I know. They submitted their story. And when you click on it, it shows you. So we have, like, we have in Hawaii, Sean. This is not me. <laughs> this is my friend, Sean. And you can see the stories that they submitted. And answering the question, how does queerness impact and work in tandem with geography, the geography of where they are? And this is something I thought was really beautiful. The stories that they were, wrote were gorgeous. Uh, I hope this link is shared with you so you can see what was said. I'm just gonna share, I put in blue some things I wanna share that really stood out to me. So in Hawaii, Sean wrote, I think that this is, a, I think uh, that this question is sort of related to being mixed race and coming from multiple cultures of growing up. If, um, I feel like spaces influence my geography, influences my queerness because sometimes I can chameleon in and out and think about how I want to engage with space and people and converse and in how I converse. Leilani from Washington wrote, my relationship with my queerness and my relationship with my home in Seattle have grown together like companion plants. My queerness, a vulnerable, juicy, ripe red tomato, and my geography, a full fragrant basil. The herb helps the tomato produce a greater yield and repels pests like flies and mosquitoes. Mm, I love that. In Oregon, Lauren wrote, I am now beginning to see similarities between my Catholic school experience and how I experienced queerness in my youth in Portland. It was something that was okay if it is if it fit a certain standard, if it was something easily understandable and fit into the somewhat wild box, it was an acceptable form of queerness. It was not certain and not set in stone. 
It was better for it to be kept behind the scenes, something only allowed for certain eyes. Abby from California wrote, when I left home for college and thus was able to leave a place that was punishing me for my sexuality, I finally felt like I could be myself. And that is when my queerness was really able to grow and develop. Maya from New Mexico wrote, I want to live somewhere where I can walk down the street holding the hand of my significant other and have little fear of what could happen. I suppose, unfortunately, it's something in the back of my head wherever I am. Anna from Texas wrote, almost every single time that we go out to eat in a restaurant in Dallas, we are asked if the check is separate or together, even with the child. Now I know that this is something small, but when you think about how a man and a woman going out to eat, especially with a kid, would not often be asked if they're together or in a separate checks. So that definitely affects our mood or just affects the idea that we're abnormal in the area, but I don't ever, ever feel unsafe for that. Hunter in Missouri wrote, by remaining here, I assert my gratitude toward the earth which does not reject my rainbows. It folds them into itself and catalyzes the energy it needs to hold the next queer who comes bounding through the corn and wheat. Sorry, I don't have a map of Washington, DC. <laughs> Amanda from Washington, DC wrote, I moved around the world to escape home, but it seems that the geography of my queerness draws me back to Washington, DC. Marina from New York wrote, moving to New York was a relief because I never had to hide who I was on the streets. And I'm so grateful to be at this point now after a long journey, after wearing masks that I could never fully let go of until college, to be fully, to be fully myself and proud. So for me, as a storyteller, as a playwright, as a young queer in the world, this is queer geography. Mapping our territory, the spaces that we have torn through, the spaces that we have suffered through, Queer geography is something that is more than a map. It is something that is lived. It is something that is remembered and something that is forgotten. So I hope now we can think about it more. Um, and then I just wanna show you some real queer geographers, some work they've done. So here's just some examples. These are four maps, queer maps of New York City alone. I mean, look at this. If you click on the links, it shows you where they go, but they map completely different things. Some map stories and experiences, some map the movement of queer people and how they move and where they go. Some map, map from memories, spaces that we have entered, spaces that we have belonged, spaces where you have felt unsafe. There are so many ways to think about this. And as you can see, there are many, and there are many already out there, and there are many more to come. So, I'm not sure how much more time I have. I think I might have a lot more time. Let's see. I see people putting things in the chat. Do I have more time, Amelia? I think you have about two more minutes before we can roll into Q&A. Um, uh -huh. And if you are all done, we can roll into Q&A a little early, but if not, the floor is still all yours. I'll oh, I'll take two minutes. By the way, Amelia, Sounds I love good. your background. Thank you. I love yours. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So in these final two minutes, um, I guess, I guess what I'll say is queerness is something, and you know, I think I actually have a, I think I have a note for maybe a final word I wanted to say. Yes, here is my note <laughs> from my final two minutes. So I, I, I'm hoping that Esri and this is what I love about being here is I have so much respect for Esri. I went to the University of Redlands right next to it. And mapping is something that I didn't really understand or think about until I was there in college. And so it's my hope that, um, and that's why I'm thankful to Esri today, that we can continue and push much harder to amplify queer geography, that we can encourage GIS scientists and geographers to think about queerness, include it in in their maps and to scrutinize the maps we have already made to think about where are queers in this? How are we representing them? How are we thinking about them? How is the space that we are, that we're already analyzing, how is it queer? How has it been queer? How can we reimagine what has been lost? And how can we integrate what has been found? You just gotta look for it. So. Those are my final words for queer geography. Um, thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to me. 
And again, to the Story Maps team for giving me the chance to share this with you. This has been really exciting. Yeah, thank you so much, Sean, uh, for joining. I think I speak for myself definitely and uh, for my team as well when I say this is, you know, a different story maps live than we've ever had in the best way. I, you know, I think uh, especially during Pride Month, uh, it's really exciting to get to see the stories that you're telling and uh, how you're utilizing our platform for such powerful uh, stories. So now we can jump into this kind of live question and answer session. Um, I see a couple different questions popping up, but one that I'll start with is just um, if you have any projects that you're working on currently that you're particularly excited about or uh, anything in the works or that you're planning. Oh, I think you're muted now. I know. Oh, I'm so <laughs> excited for the day where <laughs> I will never have to hear that again. I'm always muted. Um, I am currently a fellow a play, an immersive playwriting fellow with the state of Hawaii with the Creative Labs industry. And I am this whole year workshopping plays, working on different plays. And that's kind of my, my big groove right now. That's the forever freelance career of a playwright. I have um, some upcoming plays and projects um, that are in the works, some commissions, but everything comes back to queer place and space. And um, I'll always be updating whatever pages I have on plays that are to come. Yes. And I have one hopeful project, but it's too soon to talk about it. But if it happens, then I will share it back with all of you because it's exactly what I need to happen in the world right now. <laughs> that sounds exciting. And I'm sure I, I'm speaking for myself. I'm excited for uh, when you can share all of this. Um, <laughs> So I see a question popping up from Doreen that says she likes your opening question about how is this map queer? Where are the gay people? Very thought provoking and making me think a lot about my community in Columbus, Ohio. I would say this community is the heart of a queer migration in the state. Do you see this as a theme, migration? The movement of queer people to safe places? Oh yeah, yeah. Migration is huge in queer geography. And just in thinking about how queers, how it's, it's, and that's something that is very visible that queer people are on the coast, that we move to coastal cities because those are safe, safe havens, supposedly. But in places like Columbus, Ohio, there are always pockets, there are always spaces that have been through many battles to fight for queer space and to preserve queer space. But migration nonetheless, has happened and is constantly happening, um, primarily to places like you know New York City and San Francisco and places where queer people feel safe because there's many people, many places where we are not. Awesome. And for reference, Sean, uh, we have Dorian's email if you'd like to uh, discuss a little bit more. Dorian, I am connecting well. with you. Yes, <laughs> let's talk more. I'm happy to talk to anyone about this and learn from you. Amazing. Um, so Charles wants to know, do you see intersectional parallels between the hidden geography of queers and the hidden, the history of Native American people? Yes, in <laughs> interesting question, Charles. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm, yes, the answer is yes. I don't, I would say that I am not informed enough with the geography of indigenous peoples and Native American people to really speak on that. Um, but what I will say is Native American like queerness, like lots of folks of color, like trans dissident genders, all exist outside of the popular majority of stories and how we uh, track space, which is why the census is so important, how we understand who's where and how we think about who's being impacted and affected. So I would say in the enormous erasure that has existed and still impacts indigenous peoples to today is something that definitely parallels with invisible queer stories. Um, but I would say that probably, <laughs> this is my assumption that the histories of native and indigenous peoples and how their geography has um, 
been prof much more profoundly erased and um, stripped away than, than queer geography, perhaps. Great, thank you for those thoughts, Sean. And I, I definitely agree. Um, so for you, and this will transition into more of a story maps related question now, uh, how hard was it for you to get started with ArcGIS story maps? And what was it about ArcGIS story maps that kind of drew you to it? Um, and if you have any advice on you know, getting started for folks who might not be quite as experienced with the builder, what advice would you give? Sorry, that was a couple questions wrapped up. That's okay, I, I, I remember all of them. So what, what first got me into ArcGIS story maps was actually a class I took at Redlands called Mapping the Holocaust, where we, <clears throat> I'm also Jewish, where we uh, looked at uh, Holocaust memoirs and we tried to track spaces that people move from and stories of Holocaust survivors. And I'm not sure, I think it actually was a story map that I made. So this would have been in 2018. 2018, I did this project with Sharon Oster, Dr. Sharon Oster at Redlands. And that's kind of the first time when I thought about the implications of geography and remembering and documenting. And it wasn't until I started doing this project with the Ezri Conservation, um, that, that project I've been working on, that I started looking at story maps again. Really, I actually started because I wanted to make my resume stand out and I wanted to make it look fun in the style of a story map. It was super easy to use. I got it. And just since then, it's something that I've understood as an easy way to demonstrate uh, spatial thinking to also show statistics. And also I think in being able to see place and space that can help us empathize at certain times, especially when it comes to storytelling. So there's different ways, whether it be highlighting businesses or for different companies I work for, nonprofits, um, being able to map houselessness, being able to show where are safe spaces. Those are things I didn't share, but there are many ways that I've come to understand that it could be used today. and. Yeah, I told you I'm going to be writing a play <laughs> in story maps. <clears throat> so many more to come. And it, was that was that all the questions? Yes, I think so. Thank you. That was a great answer to a, a very long-winded question of mine. So okay. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, so uh, I remember, oh, here's a question. I remember talking with a historian at Rice University who was researching the history and changing locations of queer communities in Houston. A big challenge for him was the lack of historical data because of the history of repression and erasure. How do queer geographies deal with this? Ge geographers deal with this issue? Yeah, that is, that is the, thank you, Ellen. That's the ultimate dilemma. It, it is a history that has been intentionally erased and suppressed. So that that has always been my question is how do I track space as queer when you can't even know who is there? Many queer geographers, what they do is they try to get lived history through interviews, through mental maps is a lot of what people do. They draw mental maps and they get cartographers on board who can map out spaces that are, can only be lived through memory. Otherwise, we have to really search deep for the details. Yeah, this this uh, this historian, as I recall, uh, was was forced to look for things like uh, you know the location of gay bars and arrest records, which isn't necessarily a very accurate reflection of of, of history. But you you didn't have much choice. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and that and that's that's where it gets that's why uh for me the queer geography that i map is very contemporary um but I, how we are where we are today and honor the queer people who have been through those spaces and have influence them many many kudos and congratulations to them because it is is tremendously hard and frustrating work yes 
Yeah, definitely. Um, all right, our next question is from Christy who says, thank you. Your presentation makes me think of the situation in Chicago of renaming the Boys Town neighborhood to North, I'm gonna butcher this name, North Halstead. From what I've read, the neighborhood is using North Halstead to encourage inclusivity, but many feel as though it's erasing the history and home of many in the LGBTQ community. Do you know of other instances of places getting renamed and examples of how to confront changes of this nature? Yeah, so gentrification is huge in the erasure of queer geography. It's something that has happened time and time again. It's nothing new. I'm, yeah, I've been tracking all of that in Chicago and I first appreciated the inclusivity of trying to steer steer it away from, at least from the name alone, being like a white male majority of space. But now I'm coming to see how it is being gentrified. The same thing is happening in the Castro, which has not been renamed, but in the buyouts of people who are more wealthy, buying out queer businesses, queer bars, queer homes, and a slow push out of queer people. It's happened in every major city. There is there is no city that has not experienced the gentrification of queer space. Um, I'm not too exact on the names. I think, mo I don't know if any places have had like an actual name change versus just the demographics have changed until everyone was finally pushed out. It's in the same way with lesbian bars have been bought out, pushed out over and over again to the point where now there are only, I think, two, possibly three, four in New York City to where there used to be so many. Um, it happens quietly. It happens softly under the radar. And I would say a way to prevent it is through zaps, through demonstrations, through uh, your local elections, through, um, be, through, through occupying and supporting queer space. So if you're a queer, and you have a historic space that is queer, occupy it, live in it, be in it, spend time in it, be an activist in it. And if you are an ally and you wanna help preserve queer space, then patronize it. Patronize the hell out of it. Give them your money. <laughs> that's, that's what I'd have to say to that. Thank you, I love that. And Speaking as someone who used to live in New York and frequent those bars, I think we're at three now and 21 total in the country after having been at a crazy high number before. And it's, it's certainly been dwindling as time has gone on. Um, so thank you for that answer. And I completely agree. Um, let's see. So. I know that you had talked about the class that you had taken um, and how you kind of first got introduced to story maps, but was there any one person or project aside from that? Um, and I know you talked a little bit about Esri Conservation and how you got involved there. So if you could just touch on that a little bit more or if there was any, you know, one person who kind of like sparked that journey as well, we'd love to hear about that. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 a good question. This is kind of like a two two sided coin, as all coins are two sided. <laughs> um, <clears throat> also, thank you for sharing your harrowing statistic about lesbian bars. That is truly terrifying. Um, I would say I've been inspired by many playwrights to think about queer space, um, and that's something. A lot of the theater I make is immersive. It is experimental it takes, it really is in relationship to the space that it's in. So I've had plays produced in houses, cafes, little tiny uh, other spaces that are fun outside, like, and I like to write in relationship to the place that it's in. So that's kind of the side that really, as a storyteller, has made me into spatial thinking. But the one who asked the question earlier, Charles Convis, he really pushed me to think about, and, and think about the documentation and contributions that queer people have made to GIS. So I started with that project, 
I um, wrote profiles on queer scientists and I wrote profiles on queer um, people who have contributed to the technology that has made GIS possible, um, to which it is many of them. And so that's kind of, and then I started interviewing some people who actually work at Esri and, and people who identify as queer to think about how does the legacy of a queer scientist come and echo to you today? And how, how do you think their queerness, these scientists who helped form GIS, how do you think that influenced GIS and changed the way that we use the technology? And so, and then that's, then that's when I started really starting to think about queer geography because it became, it became less of just looking at who has contributed, but more as how has their queerness left a mark on it. So that's why I wrote that essay, the Queer Queries one. And that's how I really started getting into it. And it's something that, yeah, I story map specifically, it just felt like the natural integration for me as a storyteller. And as someone, you know, I, I have ArcGIS, I, I struggle through it <laughs> so much. If anyone wants to help me out, please and thank you. But story maps, as someone who struggles with ArcGIS, feels like um, a much more applicable way for me to integrate the kind of story I want to tell, to visualize it. And as a storyteller, there's tools in there that I feel like are, um, yeah, like that, that can be used in different ways. It's kind of like what Ross was saying. I think storytellers work really well in limitations. And I think having like a set system and having boxes, being able to utilize them in different ways is something that storytellers are yeah, just, you know, have, have the magic of. And that's something anyone that uses story maps is then a storyteller. So everyone's using it in different ways, which I think is something that's really beautiful. Yeah, I agree. And speaking as a non-GIS person myself, I think that story maps is a really great way to sort of integrate that, uh, you know, like your ability to story tell, but also being able to include, you know, maps and things like that uh, to really create very powerful place-based stories. Um, so I think we will have one more question. We have just enough time for one more. Um, and Catherine says, I'm curious about the mapping of gayborhoods. There is space that is named by the community, but not officially named. Do you know of any crowdsourced mapping projects? <clears throat> yeah, actually, I, I do know some crowdsourced mapping projects. So if you, uh, I, I think it's going to be shared out my story map collection. So on the story map I just shared with you at the bottom, I have four links of crowdsourced New York City maps, mapping projects that um, one of them I really like called Queering the Map is, is, is not in relationship to a neighborhood necessarily, but it is in relationship to putting storytelling into the community's hands and letting them tell their own stories of the spaces they've been in. Um, of course, so many of our neighborhoods, <laughs> a word I really don't use, um, so many of our neighborhoods um, have nicknames or are unofficially that um, I, you know, but to really answer your question outside of New York, my, my answer would be no. And that's something that I want to learn more about. So now I will say, I will look because I'm curious too about crowdsourced maps. Listen, if there are more than 10 queer crowdsourced maps in existence, I will be shocked and <laughs> elated so <laughs> your, your guess is as good as mine that they might not exist but maybe maybe they do yeah I think that that's a rabbit hole that I'm gonna start going down to and <laughs> right after we're done with this so um I think we're about at time now um again Sean thank you so much for joining and for being able to tell your story with us and with um, everyone else who attended, uh, I, I really I appreciate to, it. I just have to say, Sean, <laughs> you've got you've got to do that play in story map form. Oh, absolutely. Uh, we're going to hold you to that. <laughs> so uh, please share it with us when you're done. And thank you so much. 
Yeah, we're looking forward to it for sure. We'll be sharing that as well. Um, <laughs> so again, as a reminder, uh, we will be posting this video on YouTube within the next week or so. Um, please feel free to reach out with any questions that folks might have to our team and to Sean. Uh, we shared the link to his collection in the chat uh, in Zoom, but for anything else, please feel free to reach out. I think I can speak for all of us when we say thank you, Sean. And also, we're just very excited to see what stories everyone comes up with. So thank you again for participating and have a lovely day, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, everybody. Aloha. Thank you.